Are you determined to achieve your goals this year, but finding it challenging to keep up with healthy eating? Well, Factor is here to help. With America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, you can save time, eat well, and live your best year ever. Factor takes the guesswork out of clean eating, offering a wide range of meals and snacks to fit every lifestyle. Whether you're looking for keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, or protein plus options, Factor's chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals have all the ingredients you need to feel satisfied all day long. And with 34 weekly options to choose from, there's always something new to try. Don't let cooking and grocery shopping cut into your precious time. With Factor, you can skip the trip to the store, the chopping, the prepping, and cleaning up, and have your fresh, never-frozen meals ready to eat in just two minutes. Plus, with an assortment of 36-plus quick bites, smoothies, juices, and more satisfying add-ons, you can round out your meal and replenish your snack supply, all delivered straight to your door. As someone who loves spending time outdoors as the seasons change and a healthy dose of weight training, Factor has been a game changer in helping me stick to my routine. There's no more meal planning, no more cooking, and no more cleaning up. Plus, their smoothies and juices are perfect for easy snacking on the go and great for mixing with protein post-workout. And with Factor's flexibility, I can easily adjust my order size, enjoy meals with my loved ones, and even skip a week when I have a special event going on. So, if you're ready to try Factor for yourself, head over to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code LETSREAD50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Don't miss out on this opportunity to achieve your goals and live your best year yet by heading over to Factor75.com and get 50% off when you use code Let's Read 50. Way, way back when I was still a freshman in high school, my friend Tommy invited me and a mutual friend over for a weekend-long sleepover. His parents were divorced, but this was the mid-90s, so almost everybody's parents were divorced or probably seriously considering it. We were sad for him, sure, but then we learned about the other less detrimental stuff and we stopped feeling so sorry for him. I'm talking the whole two Christmases, two birthdays thing on top of having almost total freedom due to his newly acquired latchkey kid status. We were in our early teens, but Tommy's mom treated us like adults in a lot of ways. She let us stay up all night and order whatever food we wanted, all with the logic of, if you want to sleep all day after eating yourself sick, that's your problem, not mine. I guess that makes her sound like a bad mom in some ways, but I can assure you that she wasn't. Tommy was always a good kid, and although she worked long hours at whatever job she had, Tommy's mom loved and took care of him. The sleepover was planned for a Friday night, so me and the other kid brought a change of clothes and whatnot into school with us. That way, we could just head back to Tommy's place when the bell rang. Tommy's mom was there to meet us, but she had to head into work almost right away, so after leaving some money on the kitchen table for us to order pizza with, she headed out. We had the entire place to ourselves, with... Tommy's mom not due back until the early hours of the next morning. And it was wild, man. Total freedom, but being the good kid that he was, Tommy stopped us from getting too crazy. We threw a football around in his backyard for a while, and in all fairness, we did get pretty rowdy out there. So when we went back inside and quickly heard a knock at the front door, we figured that it might be the neighbors coming over to tell us to keep it down. Tommy had this attitude of, I'll handle it and told us to stay put while he went to talk our way out of trouble. Me and our mutual friend, shout out to Casey, did as we were told and kept quiet in Tommy's kitchen while he worked his magic. But when he came back, the look on his face didn't fill us with confidence. We asked him what happened and he told us it wasn't one of his neighbors at the door, it had been a friend of his dad's. I didn't piece together why that might have bothered him so much and he looked really anxious when he reappeared. So out of sheer ignorance, I asked him why that might be a problem. And Tommy sighed, took a seat at the kitchen table, and then explained the situation with his dad. To keep it short and not so sweet, to use Tommy's exact words, quote, My dad is a psycho, and so is his friends. He told us a bunch of stories about how horribly his dad had acted towards him and his mom, and the whole time, mine and Casey's jaws are just glued to the freaking floor. 
He used to hit him a bunch, and he always had a bunch of guns in the house. He used drugs right in front of a much younger Tommy like I wasn't even nothing, he would say. Real bad stuff. I think he must have been one of those guys who keeps insisting that they can change than just going back to their old behaviors, because Tommy's mom lasted a good few years after he was born before he finally got them out of there and somehow got the marriage dissolved. Me and Casey had no idea Tommy's childhood had been so crazy. I mean, we'd only known each other for a matter of months by that point, so it was all this horrifying revelation to us and obviously something Tommy didn't want to share unless he really had to. And now, he had to. But then, he got to explaining why the appearance of his dad's friend had him so spooked. First off, his dad always had a lot of different dudes coming by the house, all claiming to be his friend. So even if Tommy had been able to see the guy's face, he still might not have recognized him at all. And yep, that's how Tommy dropped that the guy had his face covered, right there in the middle of his frantic explanation. And both me and Casey were both like, what do you mean he has his face covered? And as we started to get panicky, Tom got even more agitated, and then insisted that we call the cops and his mom in that order. He'd let slip to the mystery caller, whose face had apparently been partially concealed with a scarf or something, that we were home alone that night, which in turn meant that we might well be in a whole heap of trouble. Tommy's dad had been refused any chance to see him for a few years by that time and had been trying out increasingly creative ways of circumventing the court's decision. Tommy figured that the surprise appearance might be just that, some fresh new attempt to ruin his mom's fresh start. So like she'd always taught him to do, Tommy rushed to call 911 at the first sign of danger. I feel that at this point I should make it clear that no one had any idea that Tommy's dad would try anything like that. In fact, he supposedly didn't even know where Tommy and his mom had moved to. But as I came to learn much later in life, his dad was way richer and way more powerful than I ever could have imagined at the time. He wasn't just some rich businessman or something. He was high up, in the Kansas City Mafia. Running from anyone else might have worked, but with a guy like that, finding them was just a matter of time. And it just so happened that when that moment came, me and good old Casey had to endure it too. By the time Tommy had explained the potential danger, we were all in a state of full-blown panic. I didn't think that I could get any more scared, but after we rushed to the phone and tried to call 911, things got way worse. Tommy picked up the phone and put it to his ear, then hammered 911 into the keypad. Then he did it again. And then he hung up the phone, picked it up again, and after holding it to his ear for a second, stammered out, The phone's dead. Now, if this had happened just a few years later, the phone being dead wouldn't have been a problem. We'd have just used a cell phone to call the cops, and that would have been it. But we didn't have cell phones and whoever had sabotaged the home's phone cables knew that we had no other means of contacting authorities. Then, right as we were about to totally lose our minds, we heard this huge smashing sound coming from the front door. Someone was trying to break in. Tommy didn't say a word. He didn't need to. The look on his face said it all. He ran out into his backyard with me and Casey in hot pursuit. We followed him into the woods behind his house, then just ran and ran and ran until we couldn't run anymore. Luckily, we were maybe only a minute or two walk from a collection of houses, so after knocking on their doors until we found someone that was home, we got them to call the cops for us, and we finally got a chance to calm down. By the time the cops showed up, Tommy's house was empty again, but the whole place had been trashed, probably in an attempt to find Tommy. His mom came home from work early and was talking to the cops while me and Casey waited for our parents to come get us. The adrenaline high had completely worn off by then, and I remember feeling really tired after it finally sunk in that we were going to be okay. As it turned out, the two guys who showed up to abduct Tommy were picked up by the cops as they attempted to leave town. The craziest thing was, if the sheriff hadn't received another call about a guy threatening a waitress after she got his order wrong, Tommy's potential kidnappers might have escaped completely. You heard that right. There were two guys that showed up that night. The two guys could have gotten the hell out of Dodge before anyone really knew what happened, but instead, 
they stopped for food at some all-night diner. Then one of them brandished some steak knife at a girl and, well, the rest is history. Apparently the two guys Tommy's dad hired weren't actually members of the Kansas City Mafia, as he didn't want his father and uncle, who were even higher up than he was, knowing about the kidnapping. And this gave him a kind of plausible deniability. But the 50 grand he'd promised each of the guys wasn't nearly enough to buy their silence, and they rolled over almost as soon as they were arrested. The local PD were only too happy to pursue a kidnapping charge, and when all was said and done, Tommy's dad ended up doing close to 10 years on some kind of conspiracy to kidnap charge, as well as a few others thrown in to beef up the sentence. I don't talk to Tommy much these days, although we are still Facebook friends. I like knowing that I can reach out if I wanted to, knowing that he'll always be an integral part of the single craziest and scariest story of my childhood. Hi Joel, this is my first time writing to you and since this is a very sensitive topic in my old hometown, I'd rather remain anonymous if that's okay with you. I had a friend back in elementary school, not my closest friend, but we moved in the same circles and at one point she invited me over to her house for a sleepover. I was only too happy to accept, it sounded fun, but little did I know it was a night that would have some seriously far-reaching implications. So this friend of mine, we'll call her Annie, lived with her mom and stepdad. They seemed like nice enough folks and their place was nice enough, but I guess a lot of us come to learn as we grow older, appearances can be deceptive. On the night of the sleepover, her mom wasn't due home until later in the evening. This meant that we were in the care of my friend's stepdad and because of our bedtime, we weren't likely to see her mom until the following morning. This was no big deal to me at all, but it was to my friend who kept bringing it up at odd moments while we were playing. It also became increasingly obvious that she didn't really like her stepdad at all that much, which I guess is about par for the course for some children of divorce, so I didn't really read into it all that much. But then came bedtime. We got into our PJs, brushed our teeth, and went back to Annie's bedroom to climb into bed. I asked if she had a nightlight or anything and went to turn off the bedroom's main light, but she stopped me telling me that her stepdad would be up soon to check on us. Only when he made sure that we were tucked in bed would we be allowed to turn the nightlight on and talk for a while. It seemed like a weirdly strict way of doing things, but I figured that I better just respect their systems, so I lay down on the blow-up mattress that they'd put down for me and got tucked in. I remember talking to Annie about something. I can't remember what exactly, but the conversation took this sudden turn when, out of nowhere, she said, I'm real glad you're here tonight, Sarah. Thank you for sleeping over. I guess from how it looks on paper, that sounds like a pretty wholesome moment, right? But that just makes me wish y'all could actually hear Annie saying those words, because the way her voice sounded gave them a distinctly unsettling feel. It was almost like my presence was going to prevent something bad from happening, and at the time, I figured that bad thing was just Annie being lonely on a Friday night. She also wasn't the most popular girl around and I think it played on her insecurities so it made sense that our friendship meant a lot to her. But in truth, there was a whole other reason she was glad I was there. I remember me and Annie hearing her stepdad walking up the stairs and her swiftly laying back in bed with the covers up to her chin. Now looking back on it, there was a kind of military precision to it. Annie seemed nervous, like she was focused to pass some kind of inspection which is exactly what I assumed was going on. I figured if her stepdad was that strict, I'd better do her a solid and just act likewise, so I did. I lay back down on the blow-up mattress and pulled the covers up to my chin. Annie's stepdad then walked into the room and instead of carrying himself like some drill sergeant, he seemed perfectly warm and friendly, just like he'd been all evening. Then he walks over to Annie's bed to take a seat on the edge and leans in to give her a goodnight kiss only instead of a quick peck on the cheek or forehead before standing up again, he lingers a little too long after the kiss itself. It didn't strike me as being wrong or anything, just weird. And then as he started to whisper something to Annie, she said aloud, I want to talk to Sarah. I remember thinking, so talk to me, I'm right here. 
like the whole situation just seemed really off to me for some reason and I couldn't figure out why. I knew different families did things differently. I guess I was just too naive to recognize something that would have seemed obvious if I'd seen it today. So as I'd said, Annie had thrown out some vague ultimatum, which signaled her stepdad to leave. He shifted a little, looked back at me for a moment with a smile, then turned back to start whispering something to Annie again. She cuts him off even more assertively that time, saying, Dad, I want to talk to Sarah, please. There was a brief pause, and then he said, Okay, sweetie. And after that, he finally left the room. Like I said, I knew that I just witnessed something significant, I just didn't know what. But the vibe in the room afterwards was very intense. Annie stayed quiet for a long time. Then when she finally spoke, she said that same heartwarming, turned creepy kind of thing. I'm glad you're here tonight, Sarah. Thank you for sleeping over. I didn't sleep over at Annie's house again. I think she knew that her stepdad had kind of creeped me out that night, but we stayed friends for the remainder of elementary school, and she even came over to play for a few times during the summer after graduation. Sadly, our friendship was basically doomed because we were headed for different middle schools once summer break was over. We kept in touch for a little while, but by the end of that first year, we had all but drifted apart completely. Over the next two years or so, I saw Annie around town a number of times. We were always happy to see each other, but the final few times that we bumped into one another, Annie had started to look increasingly unwell. She didn't look like she was eating or sleeping very much, but insisted that she was fine when I asked her. I just wished her all the best, then carried on shopping for track shoes with my mom. About four months go by, and I don't see or hear anything of Annie. And then, probably the most infamous crime in our town's recent history occurred. My mom broke the news to me, how a man had killed his wife, his kid, and then took his own life, before setting fire to the family home. I grew up in a real quiet mountain town, maybe only 3,000 people altogether, the kind of place where someone running a stoplight was gossip-worthy. Nothing ever happened there, so for something so awful to happen out of the blue, it rocked people to their very foundations. When mom told me, I remember feeling awful for the wife and kid while wondering what the hell had gone so badly wrong in a man to make him something so unspeakable. But that wasn't the worst part. My mom knew who the family was. The kid that got killed was Annie, and her killer was her own stepfather. I was devastated, beyond devastated really, and it hit me harder because I felt like I'd known that he was bad. He acted all friendly and warm on the outside, but what I saw in Annie's room that night was a glimpse of a man he really was. Like I said, someone older might have been able to piece it together, but I just didn't have the emotional toolkit, so to speak, to do so, and in my mind, that meant Annie's death kind of felt partially my fault. I couldn't say that, though. I just bottled it all up, knowing that even if I had said something, nothing would have happened. It's not illegal to be a little strict or weird, that was my thinking anyway, but as I came to learn, that's not quite how the law works when it comes to kids. I should have said something, that's the moral of the story really, and it's just as much a warning to others as it is a lesson to myself. If I'd have raised the alarm, even if it was voicing some minor concerns about the way any stepdad acted with her at night, that would have gotten the ball rolling, meaning there was a good chance someone would have gotten around to asking him a few questions. And if that certain someone had been a three-letter agency, and they'd looked through his computer, they'd have found a Pandora's box of vile, indecent images. Annie's stepdad was abusing her. He had been for years, and he's been documenting it too. Neighbors heard a whole bunch of shouting just before the murders, and were right about to call the sheriff when they heard the first few shots. They said it sounded vicious, the argument, I mean, and that they were pretty sure someone was smashing things in between yells. It's not 100% clear, but people generally agree that the fight occurred after Annie's mom found the pictures or videos or whatever it was on her husband's computer. The way I imagine it is that all the smashing was either him smashing phones or him trying to stop Annie's mom from getting to one so she could call the cops. Then... When Annie's stepdad realized that there was nothing he could do or say to get Annie's mom to stop or calm down, 
He grabbed his gun and shot her, Annie, and then himself after trying to destroy the evidence. He probably would have been successful if their neighbors hadn't heard the gunshots because the cops that arrived on scene quickly summoned the fire department who put out the blaze and preserved all the digital evidence in the process. The whole thing didn't come out for months and months afterwards, which I guess was a deliberate decision to try to keep people from freaking out too hard. But all it really did was divide all the grief and outrage into two parts. Hearing that Annie was being abused reignited the whole thing and had this big black cloud hanging over the town that never really went away. Me and my own family ended up moving out of town about two years later and I did my final couple years of high school someplace else. When people figured out where I'd moved from, they kept asking if I'd known the girl who had been murdered by her stepdad. I used to lie and tell them I didn't, but every time they asked, I'd have to find an excuse to take a quiet moment in order to fight back the tears. I felt horrifically guilty for a long, long time too, and it took a therapist to get me to understand that it wasn't my fault. But even so, I know there's a small part of me that will always feel partially responsible. It's all just a case of keeping that part's voice, the one that tells me it's all my fault, as quiet as possible. Hey dude, so I know this sucks and makes it sound like I'm just making this up, but I don't want to name anyone here. I watch a lot of your videos and sometimes either too much or not enough detail makes me wonder if a story is fake, but now that I come to actually write my own story up, I kind of see why people sometimes want to remain anonymous. The kid I'm about to tell you about might have grown up or turned himself around and doesn't deserve people to know about some dumb, isolated incident when he was just young. But then again, if he's still as much of a psycho as he was back then, I don't want to risk becoming the object of his attention. So back when I was a kid, I went to the sleepover with a bunch of friends from middle school. I say friends, but it was pretty loose association, to be honest with you. For example, one of the kids that got an invite actually didn't get along with the kid that was hosting. But if he didn't get an invite, he'd feel left out, and if he felt left out, the kid's mom would make it an issue, and so on and so forth. So he ended up getting one anyway. And this is the kid I want to tell you about right here. Inevitably, the two kids who didn't get along ended up clashing, not in a physical way, but the tension ramped up pretty quick and the weird kid who got the forced invite ended up storming off. The host kid's parents had quite a big place, so the weird kid basically disappeared for a while and there was no one watching us aside from a babysitter who wasn't really watching us at all, to be honest. The only other person aside from us and the babysitter was the host kid's little sister, but she had been put to bed much earlier than us, so we didn't see her past maybe 7.30pm. So the weird kid is gone for a while, but then he suddenly reappears, all sheepish looking, telling us that he thinks we need to call 911. Someone was in the bathroom and they sounded sick. We go to investigate and on the floor of the bathroom is the host kid's little sister with a bunch of puke all around her and an empty bottle of pills lying there too. The rest of the night is kind of a blur, and obviously our parents ended up getting called so they could come pick us up, but I swear to God, there was a moment during all that chaos where I caught the weird kid smiling to himself. It was around the time that the host's little sister was being loaded into the ambulance, and I don't think the kid knew anyone was looking at him, but I saw this real distinct smile on his face. And that's when I realized that the girl swallowing pills hadn't been some freak accident. She hadn't thought that they were candy at all. The weird kid had gotten her to swallow them somehow. I told my mom and dad what I'd seen and what I thought, and it caused a ton of drama with all the various parents. The weird kid totally denied it and said he's been crying in a dark bedroom because we'd been picking on him. The little monster even taunted us with his motivations while simultaneously denying it. The whole thing broke up our little friend group and as our parents basically wouldn't allow us to hang out anymore, the weird kid and his family left town a few years later, something that everyone and their dog was happy about. There were no consequences for the kid either, or his family, except for the social ones, and I sometimes wonder if he's still the same kind of person these days. I've even googled his name a while back but nothing came up. That got me thinking though, he didn't get caught the first time. And if something like that happens when you're a kid, 
that's got to embolden a person, right? He knew how to talk his way out of trouble, and he was good at it. So to me, there's no reason why I shouldn't assume that he's still out there, doing the same evil crap and getting away with it all the while. P.S. The host kid's sister turned out to be fine. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. On December 29th of 1999, two high school friends named Loria Bible and Ashley Freeman organized a sleepover to celebrate the latter's 16th birthday. The plan was to hit up a local pizzeria, then spend the evening over at Ashley's house. They'd watch movies, eat ice cream, talk about boys, all the typical activities one might expect of a teenage girl's sleepover. But little did the girls know, that night would be their last. At around 5.30 the following morning, a motorist contacted the local fire department to report that the Freeman home was on fire. After dousing the flames, firefighters quickly determined that the cause of the blaze had been arson, but were unprepared for the horror which greeted them inside. Lying on the floor of her bedroom was Ashley Freeman's mother, Kathy. She had been executed with a single gunshot to the head. There were no signs of Ashley or Loria, although the latter girl's car was found in the Freeman's driveway with the key still in the ignition. It became evident that whatever had happened, Loria Bible had attempted to flee from it and more likely than not, she had been unsuccessful. At first, some detectives began to theorize that Ashley's father, Danny, was responsible for the murder of his wife, but the possibility was quickly ruled out after his corpse was discovered under the smoking ruins of his own home. He, too, had been shot execution style. The crime caused a wave of shock and outrage to ripple throughout the local community of Welsh, Oklahoma, as well as the wider region. But despite a vocal public's impassioned demands for justice, no arrests were ever made and law enforcement was unable to track down either Loria or Ashley. Ten years went by, and police were still no closer to apprehending the girl's abductors. So in a show of dignified acceptance, Ashley Freeman's surviving relatives had her declared dead in absentia. In that time, two convicted serial killers named Tommy Lynn Sells and Jeremy Jones attempted to confess to the girl's murders, in what amounted to a striking contradiction, both men claimed to have abducted and murdered the girls, with Jones claiming to have murdered the Freemans due to their avoidance of drug debts. He also claimed to have driven both Ashley and Loria to an abandoned mine in neighboring Kansas, where he shot them and threw their bodies into an abandoned mine. Jeremy even named the mine that he'd used to dispose of their bodies, but unsurprisingly, no such remains were recovered during the subsequent search. It later emerged that Jones had fabricated the story to get better food and phone privileges whilst incarcerated, a depressingly common criminal practice made infamous by serial killer Henry Lee Lucas. It should also be noted that just a few years after the murder, serious questions were raised regarding the conduct of the Craig County Police Department. Prior to their untimely deaths, the Freeman family had been engaged in a civil dispute with the local branch of law enforcement prompted by the shooting of their eldest son, Shane. Shane had been caught red-handed stealing a car near East 2nd Avenue and was shot when an officer suspected him of reaching for a weapon. An internal inquiry found the shooting to be a lawful one, but the Freemans ignored the verdict and proceeded to file a wrongful death lawsuit. Experts would later opine that the Freemans had a very convincing argument for wrongful death and there are claims that the chief of police tried to browbeat the Freemans into dropping their lawsuit. This same chief of police would later profess regret over the way the situation was handled, but denied that his officers were involved in the Freemans' death or the abduction of Ashley and Loria. By April of 2018, the Freeman and Bible families had long since given up on the idea of seeing their girls again. They had accepted the tragic reality that Ashley and Loria was most likely deceased, but there was one wound that hadn't yet healed. Almost two decades later, law enforcement seemed no closer to identifying a suspect as they were in the immediate aftermath. Until one day, their phones began to ring. It was the Craig County Chief of Police. Ashley and Loria's killers had finally been identified. Each family remained in a state of shock as they were contacted by a team of state homicide detectives. There was good news, but 
there was also bad news. The good news was that a 66-year-old named Ronnie Dean Busick was about to be charged with four counts of first-degree murder, each pertaining to the Freeman murders. Two other men were believed to have been involved, but had passed away in prison some years prior. Yet the evidence against Ronnie Busick was so strong that a conviction was inevitable. The mention of evidence allowed detectives to segue into the bad news, at which point, the horrifying details of Ashley and Loria's final few hours on Earth were finally brought to light. It was revealed that the girls were indeed murdered over a drug debt, but one belonging to them, not Ashley's parents. Both families were reportedly stunned when they learned of this, as both girls had a clean-cut and innocent figure against a backdrop of casual experimentation. The girls were apparently given repeated warnings before finally their debtors called in Dean Busick, Warren Welsh, and David Pennington to make an example of them. Detectives heard that the men had murdered Ashley's parents before her very eyes, telling her such was the fate of those who tried to steal from their employers. The girls were then dragged outside, kicking and screaming, while one of their childhood homes burned bright in the darkness. They were thrown into a van, driven out to Warren Welsh's secluded double-wide trailer, then subjected to some of the most horrific tortures imaginable. To provide evidence that their work had been completed, the men took Polaroid photographs of the girls, bound and gagged, with terrified looks on their faces. The Polaroids also showed the girls' physical deterioration as they gradually succumbed to the horrors they were forced to endure, while some depicted the men lying next to their victims, smiling and waving, a sickening pride in their eyes. Once the men grew tired of such depravity, the girls were shot, dismembered, and then tossed into a cellar which was later filled with concrete. Busick claimed that only his two departed accomplices knew the location of the cellar, meaning their final resting places are likely to be uncovered sometime in the far future. When the news of Busick's arrest and forthcoming imprisonment were made public, Loria Bible's mother, Loreen, requested an audience with Busick so she might personally question him. Her request was granted, and on April 26 of 2018, she spoke with the daughter's killer by phone. It's believed that Busick offered her his deepest apology, saying that he deeply regretted the horrors that Loria had been subjected to. However, he denied all knowledge of the location of their final resting place. Lorene Bible spoke to the media shortly after her conversation with Busick, telling them, We welcome all information leading to their recovery. Until they are home with us, this will never be over. Dean Busick officially pled guilty to being an accessory to the Freeman murders during July of 2020, and was sentenced to serve a total of 15 years behind bars. His incarceration marked the closing chapter of a long and deeply haunting tale, but there were some who felt that justice had been insufficient. Two of the three men involved had escaped the shame of being identified as the monsters they really were, and although they were already incarcerated for various other crimes, there's no doubt that if their fellow inmates had been wise to their criminal histories, their lives in prison would have been painful, terrifying, and very, very short. In March of 1997, three-year-old Cody Stepp was living with his aunt Mickey on Hosack Street in the Hungarian village area of Columbus, Ohio. During the late 90s, Columbus was one of the safest cities in the entirety of the Midwest, yet there were still areas of the city that were considered no-go zones after dark, with vicinity of Hosack Street being one of them. Cody had been living with his aunt since December of 1996, after his mother's struggle with drug addiction inevitably landed her in jail. Robin Stepp had a long history of theft and selling her body, but managed to take relatively good care of Cody, with her only shortcoming being minor neglect. It was accepted among the Stepp family that Cody would be returned to Robin's custody as soon as it were legally possible. But on March 11th of 1997, a dark fate chose to intervene. It was just after 7 p.m. on a Tuesday when Aunt Mickey took a quick visit to a nearby corner store. She left Cody playing in her home's front yard, but due to a miscommunication with Cody's grandmother, no one was watching the boy during Mickey's trip to the store. She was gone for no longer than 15 to 20 minutes, 
but when she returned, Cody was gone. Aunt Mickey immediately reported Cody missing, and in her mind, the timing couldn't have been any worse. Cody's mother was scheduled for release the following day, and when she learned of her son's disappearance, she was furious. As police helicopters circled the city and canine officers ran their dogs through nearby fields and wooded areas, Cody's mother all but accused her sister of manufacturing her son's disappearance. In her opinion, the timing was no coincidence, and she believed that there was a concerted effort to keep her away from her son. It was a heartbreaking situation, and the Stepp family begged local law enforcement to bring Cody home. The FBI became involved almost immediately, with the Columbus Police Department sparing no expense in organizing one of the largest search efforts in the state's history. Patrol officers were reassigned to canvas entire neighborhoods, while all investigations into financial crimes were suspended, allowing the relevant detectives to dedicate themselves to the search for Cody. Even recruits at the CPD's training facility were requisitioned for the effort, with many of them scouring the banks of the nearby Scioto River. While Cody's disappearance had initially been treated as a standard child abduction, one detective refused to rule out the possibility that Cody had become embroiled in some kind of intra-family dispute. Many of Stepp's distant relatives had openly questioned their ability to raise Cody in a healthy environment, and a degree of suspicion was firmly placed on Cody's paternal relations. The case became even more complex on March 13th of 1997, just two days after Cody vanished, when the Columbus Dispatch reported that not a single one of Mickey Stepp's neighbors had stopped her nephew playing outside that evening. However, what they had witnessed was the highly unusual sighting of Mickey and her mother cleaning out their backyard shed after dark. This struck many in law enforcement as an odd contradiction, as it was already highly suspicious that Mickey allowed her three-year-old nephew to play outside so late in the first place. On March 15th, less than a week after her son had vanished, Robin Stepp was back in jail on the charge of soliciting an undercover officer. Her arrest fueled rumors that she had been detained in relation to her son's disappearance, forcing Lieutenant David Murray to clarify the reason for her arrest. It was a public relations disaster for the Steps, and even though they continued to cooperate with local law enforcement, their trial by media was far from kind. Further suspicion seemed to cast their way when police searched the vacant property next to Mickey's home. It was reported that Cody sometimes played there, completely unsupervised, another detail which contradicted Mickey Streps claim that Cody never played alone or out of their sight. Detective Murray was once again quick to stifle any attempt to turn suspicion onto the steps, stating that, quote, this is the nature of investigations, we can't exclude anything. The investigation appears to have stagnated until August of 1997 when the nationally syndicated TV show America's Most Wanted took an interest in the case. Local police took the opportunity to beg the public for information, asserting that it was never too late to come forward. There has to be people out there who initially were afraid to call us, and maybe they thought we would find him, Detective Mark Annan was quoted as saying. But we're asking them to call us, anonymously if need be, because we still need their help. When the Columbus Dispatch contacted Robin Stepp in jail, her prognosis was grim. She firmly believed that Cody had been abducted by a friend or family member, and that he'd most likely been trafficked across state lines to either Kentucky or West Virginia. Robin claimed that her family had complained to Child Protective Services about her and openly argued that she wasn't fit to be a mother. In rebuttal to these accusations, Robin was quoted as saying, I love my son more than anything in the world, and I want him back. Cody was the best gift I had ever gotten in my life. I want him to know that mommy loves him and misses him, and I want him home. Robin also stated that she was taking part in a jailhouse rehab program and planned to dedicate herself to the search for her boy once she was released. As summer turned to fall, law enforcement's official line of thinking still focused on an opportunistic abduction, but behind the scenes, an increasing number of detectives began to surmise that Cody's Aunt Mickey was responsible for the boy's disappearance. After months of intense interviews with a plethora of different witnesses, it became clear that Cody had been missing long before March of 1997. In fact, certain close neighbors claimed that they hadn't seen the boy since the summer of the previous year. Supporting this assertion was the fact that a search of Mickey's home had turned up very little evidence that Cody had been living there in the first place, 
A few items of suspiciously clean children's clothing were found, but there were no toys, no baby food, and no potty training devices, all things one might expect to find in the home of a three-year-old. Mickey Stepp denied that this was the case, claiming she'd taken Cody to a doctor's appointment that summer. Police contacted the doctor in question, who confirmed that Mickey Stepp had brought her nephew into his clinic for a routine checkup. However, when shown a photograph of young Cody, the doctor appeared perplexed. The boy in the photograph was not the same child he had seen to that day, but if he wasn't Cody, who was it? It came to light that on the night before the doctor's appointment, Mickey Stepp had contacted the parents of one of Cody's friends and invited their child to come over for a sleepover. The parents of this child trusted the Steps completely, but were forced to admit that they'd never actually seen Cody in their care. In truth, the invitation was a ruse, and it was Cody's young friend who was taken to the doctor's appointment in his place. When news of the deception reached the Columbus Chief of Police, both Mickey Stepp and her mother were invited down to the precinct to undergo lie detectors tests, but refused the invitation, with the decision marking the end of their cooperation with law enforcement. By March of 1998, police found more possible evidence against Mickey and Janice. A detective, Jim McCoskey, revealed that Cody's maternal grandmother, Janice, was suspected of having a history of child abuse. Back in 1964, Janice had lost her youngest daughter, Tenny, under highly suspicious circumstances. She too had been just three years old. Her official cause of death had been bronchitis, but an autopsy revealed several indicators of serious physical abuse, one being cigarette burns. Detective McCoskey also discovered that Tenny would be sat on a hot stove as a punishment for potty training accidents, and that prior to her death, she'd been sick for weeks on end before Janice finally sought medical attention. In McCoskey's own words, the fact that no formal charges had ever been brought against Janice was shocking, and he began to doubt that Cody would ever be seen again. In the spring of 1998, just over a year after her son was first reported missing, Robin Stepp attempted to have Cody declared legally deceased. Some observers were stunned that Robin would be so quick to give up bringing Cody home, but legal experts seemed quite certain that the move was a strategic one. On August 24th of 1998, Judge Lawrence Belkis ruled that there was not enough evidence to declare Cody deceased, saying that, at this point, we don't know if the child is missing sold for ransom, murdered, or if he fell down a sewer drain. It was a major milestone in the case and had forced many a cynical detective to reevaluate their previous convictions. The investigation had only slowed on the assumption that Cody was dead, and although there was a great deal of support on such a theory, it was just as probable that he was still alive and in the custody of relatives out of state. And with that in mind, Detectives began to re-interview Aunt Mickey and Grandma Janice, only this time, their questions had a much more accusatory tone. Although Mickey admitted to feeling responsible for Cody's disappearance, she flat out denied any direct involvement. One detective then asked Mickey to confirm that Cody had been wearing shorts and a light tee when he vanished. Mickey reportedly nodded, but was swiftly reminded that it was just 28 degrees Fahrenheit on the evening of March 11th. For anyone measuring temperature in Celsius, 28 degrees Fahrenheit is just below freezing point, meaning Mickey's step was either extremely neglectful that night, or she was lying. Another detective was sent to question one of Janice's more estranged daughters, a girl from her first partner named Diane. She was only too happy to confirm that her mother had been a monstrous disciplinarian. Janice abused all her children, but Tenny received the worst of it. Despite such damning testimony, the police determined that there simply wasn't enough evidence to support the theory that Mickey and Janice were responsible for Cody's disappearance. This ruling was challenged in the summer of 1999 when Robin Stepp attempted to prove that Cody had been exposed to the specific peril of death. If she won, it would open up the legal avenues that she needed to mount a civil lawsuit against her sister and mother. Robin's attorney claimed the appeal was based on Cody's potential exposure to the cold weather, his extreme vulnerability, and the inference that he lived in an abusive home environment. But bizarrely, a court ruled that Cody had not been exposed to any excess danger, citing that exposure to the cold and Janice's history of abuse were insufficient. If Cody had been spotted in the company of a stranger either on the day he disappeared or during the days prior, 
that would be a different story. But the fact remains that there were serious inconsistencies with the given narrative, and until they could be resolved, no such ruling could be made. Five years later, Mickey Stepp passed away, maintaining her innocence on her deathbed. She also claimed that her mother was also entirely innocent of any involvement in Cody's disappearance, saying that she hoped that one day, the mystery would finally be solved. On March 11th of 2007, the Columbus Dispatch published a 10-year anniversary article which detailed Cody's disappearance. The article included an extensive interview with Detective Jim McCoskey, who told reporters that the case remained so dear to him that he kept a box of its evidence at his home. Cody could have quite literally been sold, he said, adding that the boy might be living under an assumed name, having no idea that he's been missing since infancy. A reporter then asked McCoskey if it were possible that Cody was living happily in his ignorance. No, I don't, the detective replied. If he is alive, he might well have been sold into some kind of human trafficking ring. We just don't know. Eighteen months after the dispatch ran their anniversary piece, police received a call from an anonymous tipster who claimed that the child's body was buried in a field off Parsons Avenue, not far from where Cody had been staying with Mickey. A cadaver dog was dispatched to search the field, and it indicated that human remains were present in several different spots. A large backhoe was used to excavate the area of interest, but frustratingly, nothing was found. Robin Stepp welcomed the news, reasserting that her boy was alive, an assertion that was vindicated a short while later when a rather intriguing blog post began to make the rounds. A woman by the name of Linda Fox claimed to have had a very unusual interaction with a boy near Lebanon, Ohio during December of 2007. Linda said that while driving around three miles east of the town, she'd spotted what appeared to be a nine-year-old boy walking at the roadside. Given that it was raining, Linda offered the boy a ride and struck up a conversation with him during the drive. The boy told her his name was Irwin and that he was 13 years of age. This immediately struck Linda as odd, as the boy seemed no older than elementary school age. Then, when she asked him where he lived, the boy appeared to have no idea. He knew that he was living with his aunt named Donna, but had no idea what either of their surnames were. Undeterred by the boy's apparent ignorance, Linda continued to drive him around, until finally deciding the best thing to do was to drop him off at a local police station. The officers there would be much better at helping young Irwin and... If there was indeed something untoward going on, then they'd most certainly pick up on it. However, when Linda announced her motherly intentions, little Irwin began to protest dramatically. He insisted that he wasn't in trouble, and then fled from the car as soon as she parked outside the precinct. Following the encounter, Linda said that she searched Ohio's missing children database, making a shocking discovery in the process. While browsing one organization's website, Linda noticed the missing person's profile of a certain Cody Stepp. The profile included an age-progressed picture of the boy, depicting what he might look like at this current age. The picture looked almost exactly like little Irwin. Linda ran to her car to retrieve the small ice cream carton that Irwin had been eating out of during the previous evening. Linda had briefly stopped to buy the boy ice cream to calm him down, but he still fled her car once they arrived at the police precinct. Linda claimed that she drove straight back to the same precinct and turned over the ice cream carton as potential forensic evidence. She also directed the police to the missing person website she'd been browsing, vehemently insisting that the boy she'd seen was Cody Stepp. An officer attempted to assuage her fears, telling her that the boy was most likely just a local runaway, but Linda wasn't convinced. She tried to keep in touch with the officers she'd spoken to, but there seemed to be no developments, and in the end... They politely asked her to stop calling. Linda's story certainly makes for an interesting one, but it's worth noting that it's never been properly verified. Most of the details in her blog post are information that was freely available to the public, meaning there's always a chance that her account was fabricated. In the fall of 2014, the Columbus Monthly published an article which revisited Cody Stepp's disappearance. They spoke with his mother, Robin, who had been clean for four years by that point. She said that she thought about Cody every day, how chubby his cheeks were, and how full of energy he was. She was still optimistic that Cody would be found one day, yet Detective Jim McCoskey did not share her optimism. By 2014, McCoskey was convinced that Cody was dead, 
and that his aunt and grandmother were somehow responsible. Both Mickey and Janice had both passed away by that time, meaning any secrets they held had been taken to the grave. Pamela Taylor, whose son had given Robin a ride on the day that she got out of prison, told ABC that she was hopeful that Robin would one day be reunited with her son. There's no closure, she said, and there never will be until the day we find him. I just hope that it's here on Earth. If he's still alive, Cody Stepp is 29 years old and may not even remember his old family. Perhaps Detective McCoskey is right and Cody was dead before he even was reported missing. But then again, maybe a mother's intuition is correct and Cody is out there somewhere, be it in West Virginia, Kentucky, or maybe even Lebanon, Ohio. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or send it over email at let's read submissions at gmail.com, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm just a little fella who loves berries and meat. <laughs>